Five by 15. Five speakers, 15 minutes each. So 15 minutes, no longer than 15, no less than 15. I will keep time. But where did this amazing idea come from? So it started in London, and it spread to Milan, to New York. And tonight, for the first time in Vancouver and in Canada, we will be having our first 5 by 15 event at Indian Summer Festival. So that's a huge thing to celebrate. Yeah. But how did that happen? I, I want to recognize somebody. Is Eleanor, Eleanor O'Keefe here? Is Eleanor here? No, she's not. She's in London. Of course she's in London. Well, she's a friend of Indian Summer Festival, and she's one of the founders and co-founders of 5 by 15. So... What are, we, what are the rules for this amazing genre of uh, speaking? It's unscripted, it's free flow, and it's stick to time to 15 minutes. So should we begin? Should we begin? Yeah? So, born and raised in White House, Whitehorse, Yukon, an award-winning author whose first love is to have live storytelling, music, as I learned tonight as well. So let me tell you my... my um, what my experience with Ivan. So I was, on the, uh, I was on the internet, you know, that old thing that we click on, and I, I, got to, I got to see some of Ivan's work, and what I remember, one of the pieces that I saw Ivan do was what's called Dear Younger Self. It was a letter to her younger self. And I thought to myself, what would I, what would I write to my younger self? What would you write to your younger self if you had that opportunity? Maybe we all should. Fascinated by the intersection of storytelling and music, we will hear Ivan's talk, What My Grandmother Left Us. Ladies and gentlemen, Ivan Coyote. Hi, everybody. I'm going to be joined tonight by my, my friend and compadre and comrade John Wood on the guitar. John and I have made a couple of records together and I'm going to do a little chunk of a show that we're working on. This show's called uh, Craft Singles for Everyone. <laughs> it's, an, it's kind of an homage to my grandmother. You ready to go there, my friend? So my grandmother, may, may she rest in peace. She was prone to these very strange acts of ritual. And she performed them sort of routinely, and she taught us all, all of her five children and her nine grandchildren, to do likewise. And none of us ever really questioned any of her habits until we got much, much older. Um, but she would take a pinch of salt. If she ever spilt any in the kitchen, she would immediately take a pinch of salt in her right hand and throw it over her left shoulder. And we were forbidden to ever hang up pictures of living relatives or living people of any sort on the walls. She had this belief that if there was an earthquake or a tremor or even maybe a drunk guy just kind of bump, bumped into it with his shoulder and knocked it to the ground, it would, it would bring an, un, an early demise upon the living person in the photograph. That was her belief. Our, our school photos were framed, but she would just prop them up, lean them against the wall on top of the mantelpiece, or use that little stand thing on the, on the frame and put them up on top of the bureau. Never, ever hang them up on the wall, though. Hanging up pictures of already dead people, totally fine. <laughs> you were never to place a hat upon a bed for some reason. And I'm not sure whether this would curse the hat or the bed, or the hat wearer that was never made clear to any of us, but you just did not do it, okay? And if you ever bought someone a wallet or a purse as a gift, you had to go down to the bank before you gave it to them and, and get a, sh a shiny brand new penny and tuck it inside, or you were forbidding them. You were, you were, um, you were committing them, actually, um, to bad luck, bad financial luck for an undisclosed period of time, right? So no hats on beds, no living relatives on the walls, uh, no empty wallets, 
Yeah? Uh, and no questions. No questions. That's just how you did, okay? And I guess at the time, we all thought it was sort of a Catholic thing. That's what we figured. And the Catholics, uh, they have this saying, um, yours is not to wonder why. I believe it was invented to quell dissent of all sorts, actually. Yours is not to wonder why. Yours is just to do or die. So I'm sure we wondered, but we never asked, right? And so it wasn't until I started uh, interviewing her at length for what my family, in 2003, I started interviewing her for hours at a time for what my family had taken to calling my little art projects, <laughs> that uh, she began to show the dusty corners of her life story to us, the real story. See, she had been taught to lie about who she was because I guess it wasn't a good idea to be half Irish traveler and half Roma or gypsy in London, England during Hitler's rise to power in the Second World War. It was better to just be a, an, a, an English girl, even a poor one. So that is what she always said that she was. Fear of being unwanted, of being the other, of being disposable. That is the greatest tool for forced conformity we have ever, ever invented as a, as a race of people, right? Yeah, it was a powerful enough tool to sustain a lie like that across an ocean, even down through all those generations, even in the last years of her 90 years of life, even sitting at her own table in her special chair, at her, you know, with a cup of hot tea sitting right in front of her, even then, the truth of her still came out in just these little shy fits and starts, but I was there to hear it, to write it down to save it from the dark. She, uh, she had this New Year's Eve ritual. I don't know where it came from. Maybe it was passed down to her from her secret people. Maybe it was a Roma thing. I don't know. I guess I'll never know. But what she did was she would take one log of firewood, small log of firewood, and a fistful of silver dimes that she would collect up all year. Um, back then, dimes were still made out of real silver. Remember that? And she'd put them in a crown royal bag along with uh, candlesticks, silver candlesticks, her silver and turquoise ring, anything silver. And then she'd get a loaf of bread and, uh, and then she would pick someone from the party. Had to be a young man, unmarried, I believe, um, with brown hair. And that person would lead a contingent of revelers in a run three times around the house, clockwise, carrying those three items. So we would run. We would, we would run. Me, sometimes wearing my parka over top of my pajamas, following my aunties and my mom who were always drunk on white wine or maybe gin and tonics. And they would be like laughing and slipping on the ice until Deb Walsh from up the street peed a little in her gabardine pantsuit. Our, eye, our, our, uh, our breath collecting into ice on our eyelids from the Yukon cold. And then later I would, I would run as a teenager wearing just a Lee Storm Rider jean jacket and bald tennis shoes and no mitts on because I thought it was cool. In all that cold, we all thought it was cool. And then later on still I would run as a young person out of my own run around and around my beat up but beloved little attic suite in that house that eventually burnt down 14 years I ran around that house until it was no more the firewood it's to represent warmth a safe roof shelter and the silver that's for prosperity Good work given and done. And the bread, well, 
the bread. Well, the hope is, is that you'll break it and share it with your loved ones. So you run to conjure up these things to invite warmth and, and wealth and, and plenty into your new year, into your home. So a couple, couple of years ago, at New Year's, my wife, Zena, and I, we threw a party at our house, and uh, I wasn't really planning on it, but kind of sort of at the last minute, around 9 o'clock, I just kind of got the idea, so I called up my friend Cynthia. She's the only person I actually know in Vancouver who still possesses a working fireplace. I asked her if she would bring a couple of prime pieces of kindling with her, and then uh, I inherited my grandmother's love of the pre-1968 real silver Canadian dime. So I had a fistful of my own squirreled away, and I tucked them into my own faded Crown Royal whiskey bag, good for marbles, good for so many things. And I stuck a candlestick in there, and um, some jewelry, and an antique spoon, and then I procured a leaden loaf of um, sunflower, gluten-free sunflower flax bread. <laughs> Weighed about eight pounds, got it out of the freezer, and then just after midnight, I, uh, I gathered up a group of us who were game enough to come and run with me. I had never run around a roof that I owned before. It's a very small roof, and it's attached to a bunch of other roofs. And we won't really own it for, like, what, another 21 years or something? But still, you know. And so when we, uh, when we left the foyer and we got out onto the sidewalk, that is when I realized this was not going to be three drunken laps around a small, you know, f- single dwelling in the country like the good old days. You know, this was going to be three fairly sober loops around an entire city block because we live in a 57-suite condominium <laughs> attached on all sides to the buildings next to it. So we ran. We ran. We ran in high heels, and patent leather shoes, my good fluvog boots I was wearing, and we ran, hiking up sequin gowns and holding boobs and w- wigs and wallet chains in place. We ran, there was two writers, there was an installation artist, a gender sciences research- researcher, a PhD candidate, there was a librarian. There was a longshore woman and a boxer, I think it was, and we ran. We ran out the front door, we ran past the bakery, we ran past the laundromat, we ran around the corner by the corner store, we ran down through the alley, through the smell of pee and dumpster, and we waved to the two ladies working the parking lot outside the 7-Eleven. And we, uh, we laughed with the two drunk guys at the bus stop bench. We ran. Me with my, my grandmother's blood and my veins rushing in warm beats past my eardrums. We ran, trying not to puke up the duck confit and shiitake mushroom gravy poutine we had all just eaten. Oh. And the whole time we were running, I could feel my grandmother there with us. It's the spirit of her shining down. And after, when we all piled back into the elevator, blood-cheeked and breathless, we were laughing so hard we had to lean on each other for support. And I I felt my grandmother lean over and whisper into my ear. You know what she whispered to me? Across that bridge of habit and ritual and tradition from the great beyond. She leaned over. She said, what's the matter with you, eh? Running around in your good boots like that, eh? You want to ruin them, eh? Do you be foolish, do you? That's not how I taught you to be, no. So don't be so vain. Next time, go. Wear your sneakers. Why do you think they call them running shoes? You run in your running shoes. That's what they're made for. Go. 
God. So I don't know where I'm going to be. I don't know where we'll be on New Year's this year or next year. I don't know who we'll be with or what we'll be doing. But what I can tell you is that no matter what I'm wearing, I'm going to have a pair of running shoes in my backpack. You know, on account of it's tradition. Thank you. It's John Wood. Ivan Coyote. Thanks for having us. Ivan Coyote, thank you. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you. Is it me or did I just see my whole life flash before my eyes? Crown Royal bags. Hmm. What did you guys think? Please. Yeah, yeah. Remarkable. Five by 15. And you know, you were right on time, too. Like, you're awesome. That's amazing. I'm the timekeeper for the ni- tonight, everybody. Just so you know. Um, official, uh, official news there. Michael. I, um, I got a chance to uh, do some interviews last year. Um, and uh, I got to interview... Uh, a gentleman from the Haida Gwaii. And in that process, I got to see the art and the culture. And when I was researching um, Michael Yaklanas from the Haida Gwaii, who's going to be speaking next, I got to see those remnants of amazing work, history, and a culture that I was not aware of that was just very close to us. Raised in the Haida Gwaii, Um, He began working as an artist after many decades in the leadership of the Haida Nation's successful campaign to protect its people, indigenous culture, and environment. I'm very, very excited to hear Michael's talk tonight. He's going to speak on why Indians matter. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Yaklanas. Thank you. Oh, what an entrance. They said unscripted. I came unprepared. (laughs) I didn't even stand in front of the mirror for 15 minutes. My sense of the 15 minutes, it's going to go kind of slow and awkwardly at first. And then gradually, as we get into a groove, you know, we start connecting, I suppose. I think it will go faster. I suspect that the last three minutes are going to be condensed and hurried. So I, I, need your, I need your help, and I'd like you to give me a five-minute signal and a ten-minute signal and a three-minute signal, because I'm going to try and cover some ground. First of all, this is the second time that I've been able to be on a stage that was uh, uh, graced by my dear friend Ivan who's blows me away. You're good. Really. Ivan is a writer, just in case you haven't uh, accumulated some of her books on your bookshelf. My recommendation is to do it. Um, I feel a lot of connection with what you describe because, like yourself, I've, I've grown up in a rural community. And <clears throat> you may be able to tell, perhaps, I am a person of hybrid ancestry. And as such... I lived on an Indian reserve, and I lived off an Indian reserve. And most of my younger years, I was very conscious of being in the middle, of being able to fluidly move back and forth between that chasm, that huge cleavage that divides so many of us, based on this strange notion of cultural ethnicity and dominance and all the tensions that really mark the relationships between indigenous peoples in Canada. And I want to talk a bit about that tonight. I'm a visual artist, not a performance artist, so um, I'm going to need you to help, help me and work with me. And there's going to be times when we need to make logical leaps, and, and you're going to have to make them with me and jump with me. I'm going to try and explain what the view looks like it, from the middle. 
And I'm going to talk a little bit about a career that was about 25 years long in leadership in Masset and in the Haida Nation. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Supreme Court case decision that we've probably all heard about. Is show of hands, we heard about this at all? Ooh, good, a friendly crowd. I don't have to give you shit. Great. Okay, well, we just lost five minutes of my talk. Maybe we'll have a few minutes of meditation. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to try and blend that into what I do as a visual artist. And I'm going to refer to two books, Flight of the Hummingbird and probably Red, just because it's been released again, and I, I need to pump it a bit. The Flight of the Hummingbird... Um, is a really good uh, teaching tool for what it's like to be, to see the world through a Haida lens, an indigenous lens, if you will. And it is strangely and unfortunately absence, absent in a Canadian world. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Canada, born from the loins of the world's most aggressive and militaristic society, England, a country that has military activity in all but 22 of the current nation states on the planet. I want to talk about Canada, this Western democracy. I want to talk about it as a Haida coming from a society where we don't have kings and queens. I'm going to talk about the role of an individual in Haida society and the obligations of that person to the group because I think it's a useful message for those of us who call ourselves Canadian citizens. The forest was on fire. All the animals fled before the raging flames, except for a small bird. The hummingbird darted over to a small stream, picked up a bead of water, flew back over the flames, and dropped the water again and again and again until finally the bear looked up at the hummingbird and said, what are you doing? Bracket, stupid? Close brackets. And the hummingbird said, I do what I can. That is the obligation that I grew up with as a Haida citizen. And it's interesting that in this story, this very ancient story that I ripped off from the Altiplano in Peru, we never know whether the hummingbird put the fire out or roasted up into a little kebab in the sky. Because, my friends, it's really irrelevant. When we took to the blockades in 1985, we didn't really know how it was going to work out. Us and the 50 policemen who were staying in the logging camp just around the bend, we didn't think what life might be getting busted for uh, contempt of court, which, as you may know, is the most serious charge in Canadian law. You, you, don't, you, don't, you don't piss the courts off around here. They throw you in the slammer pretty quickly. I mean, you can go out and kill somebody, you can maybe steal some property, but you don't disrespect the courts. And we never thought that far because we were on the line doing what we can, and it's process-driven. It doesn't matter whether the fire is put out, and it doesn't matter whether we die in the effort before us. It's committing ourselves to becoming involved. I flew down here on a plane and came here on a boat and yesterday, in the company of new friends over at in West Hastings with Orijit Sen and David Wong, and we talked about this city here. And Orijit compared this city to the creative, 
creativity of his New Delhi home or his Goa home. I, I think that was what he was referring to. We talked about how the streets are laid out. I mean, they're nicely sectioned out and blocked off and controlled and engineered. And we don't have anything to do with that as individual citizens. And I want to push this a little further and say, and if we see a crime being committed across the street, the best we might do is to call somebody to become involved. Or if we send our neighbor's children over to do violence to somebody else on the other side of the world, we don't really get involved because isn't there a ministry for that sort of stuff? And if we see somebody who's hungry on the street, don't we kind of think that maybe there's somebody that's going to take care of that? What I see from a Haida, let me say a hybrid perspective, is that in Canadian society, it's all about specializing and removing the responsibility that we have as an individual to the group. There's a policeman to take care of that crime scene. There's a charity that's going to feed those people. There's a federal government that's in charge of what happens to overseas far away when we send our troops out there to become deep, deeply, deeply injured and to do violence somewhere else. And that is so strange from a Haida perspective where you have to assume responsibility for what's going on in the community. Now, I think, how am I doing for time? I'm good. I like that. One more minute till the first five? Till my last five. Okay. I'm having a time warp up here. Okay. So <laughs> let me give you some, let me give you some uh, t tools here, if you will, because there's a whole lot of Haida stuff going on in this town, especially out at the Museum of Anthropology at MOA. You know that there's a big, beautiful longhouse out there, and I want to just explain how that um, works as a, as, a, as a model of how Haida see the world. There are four posts on the corner of the house, just like at the corner of the room here. And the doorway of the house in a properly designed, properly engineered Haida village faces the water. And the back of the house faces the forest. And the reason for that Unlike Canadian cities, where we design our towns according to how, how much it's going to cost us to put in a meter of sewer line, in a Haida community, we have this line from the ocean that comes right through the house and goes out the back door. The ocean is the creative. The house is our own body. Our entire life is contained within the dwelling. In the middle of the house is a fire, and there's a line that reaches up and below us, and it anchors us to ten separate worlds that exist simultaneously and that are occupied by other creatures. And then there's another line, and this is the one I like the best because it works with you in the audience. If you just, for a moment, think of the person sitting next to you, if you want, you can stare deeply in their eyes. It's not up to me to say not to do that, but be aware that there are people sitting next to you. And generally, they're looking the same direction you are. And that's how a Haida village is set up, houses side by side. And there is a line running between each and every one of us that connects us. That's a societal line. This is the creative line out to the ocean. This is the cosmic line. And our life is connected in the very center of our relationships to the cosmos, to each other, and to our own personal life, our own creativity, our birth, and our own death. And that's what keeps us balanced. When you go to the Haida house, just imagine that, that little centered place right in the middle of our lives. And we've had to hold that place for about 200 years of this rather rough, an unfriendly ride with Canada. Now I'm going to talk quickly about the Supreme Court decision and you, with that show of hands I'm sure that you understand that the shift has now been uh, the relationship between in Indigenous peoples and Canadian society has gone from one of consultation which is a really good weasel word to, to one of consent. But here's the thing that disturbs me about it. 
Everyone is saying it's got nothing to do with individuals. This is a government business. Well, with all due respect, I think the government's done a really good job of messing things up for a long time. When we stood on that line in 1985 against corporate interests that were owned by various ministers of the provincial government at that time, we were supported by regular citizens, regular Canadian citizens. When we finally did go to court, the province argued, this world is going to fall apart. You can't give the Indians anything. Chaos is going to rule supreme. And on our side, two mayors of two small Canadian rural communities stood up and said to the court, we trust the Indians more than we trust our own government. Oh, I love that. That's got to work for me. Thank you. So here's the thing. Societies evolve. We change constantly. And elites like to kind of control the way the change is coming through because that, they see that as their job. There's a lot of places in this world where the fire is raging, where violence is really being used as a tool for social change. And, and probably not very good, but, but anyways, I don't want to wander down that path for a minute. Here in Canada, there's a lot of problems. And I would say to you here now that the tool for social change for all people, regardless of ethnicity, is through Aboriginal title and rights. It is constitutionally rooted. It trumps the legislation. It has judicial, moral, social, economic aspects to it. What has happened in Haida Gwaii since the blockades in 1985 has made life better for all people, regardless of ethnicity. White people are happy, Haida people are happy. We're getting along just great up there. It's not perfect. I'm not here to sell you snake oil. But I'm saying, I'm really concerned when I see the, the, the word coming out saying, this has got nothing to do with regular people. This is government business. You people, just step aside. We'll take care of it. Bullshit, I say. The question for you, for all of us here, as sentient humans, as good citizens, is what is our personal relationship to indigeneity? What is it that we can do in support of making this recognition by the Supreme Court of Canada work for the betterment of people? And I think I'm almost out of time. I'm going to say, when I was a young lad, there was a fellow I used to push around in a wheelchair, wheelchair Percy Gladstone, one of the sort of intellectual powerhouses of the Haida Nation, who had fought in the war, had come back, totally unscathed, Second World War, first day at home, gets in a car accident, loses his legs. So he spent a lot of time thinking about the world, and I remember him being at a, at a camp, a logging camp meeting with a whole bunch of loggers, and Percy said, the resolution of land claims, is what they called it at that time, I'll, I'll say, the resolution of Aboriginal title and rights will mean that those people in the room will have rights to their homes. It won't belong to the bank, it won't take 21 years to pay it off, and what he was saying was that it becomes a tool for all of us. But in order for it to become a tool for all of us, we've all got to work together and be on the same team. So, you know, I, I guess I, I just want to say, well, there's many things I just want to keep going with, but I just, I'm going to leave the stage in a few seconds, and I just ask for you to think of that question. What is your re personal relationship to local indigeneity? Claim it. Be like a Haida and, and, and do what you can. The, the, the model that, that we're working with here is one of Western kings and queens. And they've been living on a castle and telling us lads and lasses down at the bottom of the hill that we are subject to their domination, control, and better governance. And it's just messed things up somewhat terribly. So... Uh, So, thank you. I, I didn't want to really get into a rant, but, uh, I, I, you know, I, I just, I call for peaceful evolution between peoples. And I want to thank the organizers for uh, trusting that I wouldn't get too out of line and give me 15 minutes to come here with you tonight. And thank you very much for supporting the festival. It feels really yeah. good. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael.
Thank you. From one Indian to another, that was amazing. Thank you. Wow, a lot of powerful words. What do you guys think? Yeah. Artists have words. Artists have expression. And Michael, thank you for that. Yeah. You know, when I was a kid, when I was growing up, I used to like totally make believe, thinking I want to be famous. I want to be an actor. And that didn't pan out too well for me. So um, I went and went into speaking arts. And uh, but when I see actors and when I see performers, I admire them. So right in our backyard, from Port Moody, yeah. Anita Majumdar. Yeah, let's talk about Anita. So Anita's first love was theater. She's a well-known Canadian theater artist who has performed everywhere from Canada's Stratford Festival to India's, India's Museum Theater. Uh, an acting graduate of the National Theater School of Canada. She's graced the cinema screens, which is one of my favorites. Uh, it's great to see someone from your area of the world do something amazing. She was in Deepa Mehta's film, Midnight's Children. This woman is a true artist, a true performer, and I'm very impressed by all her accolades. And I would like to invite her up to speak. And her talk today will be about cooking stories with only half the ingredients. Ladies and gentlemen, Anita Majumdar. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to say the same, uh, the, the same request that Michael had. Uh, ditto. I, I also need uh, a five and a ten and another five. Um, I, I would like to know who is in charge of programming, um, mainly because uh, Michael, that was amazing, and Reza is after me. So uh, here I am. Uh, I find uh, I'm a performer, uh, and part of what I'm going to talk about tonight is, um, is my work as a playwright uh, and the stories I tell, but... Uh, I just, the disclaimer I'd like to put out is uh, that it is far harder to be myself on stage. Um, my curtain call uh, at the end of a show is actually the hardest thing that I have to do because I actually can't play a character anymore. I have to come out and people clap for me and I find that really uncomfortable. So this moment right now is very uncomfortable for me. So thank you all for that. Uh, so, so uh, Shirish made me come up with a title for this thing, and I made up something, and hopefully, but it's unscripted, so I have to be unscripted, but, but also be scripted, because we had to come up with a title. So this is called <laughs> Cooking Stories with Half the Ingredient, uh, which means, because it's about cooking, uh, I really, really love beauty products. So I love, I, I do, I just, I, I love them so much. You can ask my, 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 my boyfriend's here in the crowd and he's just spent the afternoon going around looking for beauty products along with me. Uh, and the thing is, is that I come from a really frugal household. Uh, so like I, I love, I love do-it-yourself beauty products. And that's a little shout-out to Jugni Style, who I write. Uh, I, I, I write these DIY uh, recipes because uh, basically my entire life has been about wanting, wanting my life to be grand. And in my house, that meant looking like Ashwarya Rai uh, from Hamdil Dechuke Sanam. So it's very specific. Uh, and that pretty much just meant looking like a white girl. Uh, and so we spent these, like, these childhood summers of trying to lighten my skin, but, but not with chemicals, and we, because we couldn't afford them, but also because uh, that's bad. So my mom would come up with these, like, these, she'd tell me what we do in the old country. We do this. We'd do, like, you know, we take some curd, and then we take some, like, nimuras, and... I just, what the hell is curd? I don't, I don't know what to do with that. And so we're like, no, no, okay, we'll just use some yogurt, uh, but like Canadian style. Uh, and then we mix it together and put it on my skin and nothing happened. Nothing ever happened. Uh, but we just, we, we kept at it. We like scrubbed it off. Uh, and 
to us, looking like a white girl or Ashwarya Rai from Hamdil Dechuke Sanam uh, meant having, having fair skin and light brown hair. And so my mom had said, okay, well, well we, should, we should put henna in your hair. And then, well, where are we going to get henna? And at this time, like, we live really far away from Main Street. Um, <laughs> So we're like, where are we going to get this henna stuff? So we just got coffee grinds <laughs> and olive oil and a little bit of nimburas. Uh, so it was like, like our made-up sun-in. Uh, and we put it through my hair, and again, nothing really changed. And it was so frustrating because I still just look like me. And that's the thing. That's, I, on top of loving beauty products, I love Bollywood, and I thought I'd outgrow this. And I'm the age I am now. And uh, I still really love Bollywood, and I'm waiting to outgrow this. Um, but to me, I wanted everything to be grand like Bollywood. Uh, but it never was. My hair was the same color. My skin was the same color. Uh, and I just I led my life this way. I went to the National Theatre School, and I decided I was cooking for the first time, so I, I wanted to make butter chicken, but I wanted to make it in a grand way. I wanted to make it the way they made it at Himalaya Restaurant, which I realize isn't... Maybe not the highest bar. But... <laughs> Anywho, uh, I want to make it that way. I wanted, like, that, the kid on the box, Babla's kid, to be really proud of me. <laughs> so I made my butter chicken, and this is, this is the problem. It, it tasted good, like, if I do say so myself. But it didn't taste like butter chicken. It tasted like something else. It always turned into something else. This has been, like the theme of my life is that I, I go about trying to do something and it's good, but it's not that. Uh, like I draw drawings of Ashwarya Rai from Hamdil Dechuke Sanam. Uh, and I was like, I had these visions of what it would look like in charcoal and it, would, it was nice, but it didn't look like her at all. <laughs> uh, uh, I remember I was at UBC, and there's a little shout out to Naveen Giran. Uh, we used to do these UBC dance shows. And so we decided we we're going to dance Nimbura from Ham Dil De Chuke Sanam. Uh, but she does this move in the middle of the dance in the instrumental section, and we, like, she's, she's a really good dancer. We couldn't figure out what the hell she's doing, so we had to come up with some other move uh, that wasn't nearly as, well, I didn't think it was nearly as good, but we only had so many resources. I was starting to learn classical Indian dance at the time, and I only, you know, I, I only know as much as they can teach me uh, in these weekend classes. And so we, it just kept going like that, and it felt so Canadian, and it felt like this giant apology that I always had to say, like, ah, well, yeah, it's the Canadian version of this. Uh, well, you know, we only had, like, we didn't have that, so we did it the Canadian way. Uh, and then this, this point was furthered when I was doing Bombay Black uh, here in Vancouver, and uh, a version of Bombay Black uh, written by a uh, famed uh, writer and playwright, Anoshi Rani. Uh, <laughs> so a version of Bombay Black was done in India. And uh, there's someone who produced Bombay Black, uh, a notable person, let's call him Monik Davar. Uh, he, he, he had done the show and he came to our dressing room and he, he came up to us and he was like, yeah, so your production was very uh, Canadian. And I was like, oh my God, when will this stop? I just, I, I want to be Indian. I want to be Ashwarya Rai, which is ironic because she doesn't actually look all that Indian. But I want to be grand. I want to be, I want to be Indian. I think that's the bottom line is I've always wanted to be Indian. I'm Canadian and I, I was so angry and my parents were bringing me to this country because I just wanted to be Indian. That was my life story. I want to be Indian, but I'm not. Uh, so then, fast forward uh, to, to me writing a play called Same, Same, But Different which uh, just had its premiere this, earlier this year, uh, both in Toronto and Calgary, uh, which is a, it's a, it's a bit of a tribute to uh, those childhood summers that my mom and I spent uh, trying to lighten my skin. Uh, but it's a Bollywood musical. So, uh, so it's a Bollywood musical, and me and Subha Sankaran, um, 
famed composer Suba Sankaran from Auto Rickshaw. Uh, she was the composer of the piece. Uh, how am I doing for time? Awesome. Wicked. So Suba and I sit down in her living room and we're trying to figure out, like, how do we do this? Uh, so it's a Bollywood musical. You have to have Bollywood songs. Uh, we need Bollywood songs, but we, you know, we, have, a Cana- we have a Canadian budget uh, and for theater, <laughs> which if any of you are familiar with arts budgets, it's like a pile of compost <laughs> and maybe a bag to carry said compost. So we're sitting there thinking, well, what do we do? Like, how do we make a Bollywood music? I'm not backing down on this Bollywood thing. So what do we do? How do we make Bollywood songs uh, with the resources that we have uh, and still let people know that this is a Bollywood show? So what we did have was we had two voices, a mic, and this wicked computer program. I don't know if you guys know about this. You should really get it. It's called GarageBand. Uh, and then we made this. Alex, please. <laughs> to say uh, I've always been attracted to beautiful Indian things Um, I've always wanted to be one I wanted that beautiful Indian things to be around me all the time except I lived in Canada and it's an aesthetic that I ended up taking to the theater with me and it was never my intention uh, to uh, I guess capitalize on being Indian It it was that that's how I thought that's how I continue to think. I, I think in Bollywood song and dance sequences. I, 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 wa- I wish my life was actually like that, but it is not. Uh, and so I just do that on stage instead. Uh, and, you know, uh, Zarka and I were in conversation yesterday, Zarka Nawaz. Um, and, you know, she talked a lot about how she doesn't want to analyze her own work. And I, I feel the same way. People would analyze my work and talk to me about how I was subverting the style and I was subverting, uh, you know, the, 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 the sort of telltale, like, the Canadian identity story, the, like, I'm from here, but I feel like I'm from over there. Like, where do I fit in? Uh, and I didn't know I was doing that. And I still don't really think I'm doing that. I just... I think of dances and I think of the song and then I make it up and then I build a plot around it. Um, What I realized I ended up doing was uh, taking all the things that I actually somehow deep down know I will never be uh, and exchange it for the Canadian identity that's always been mine. Uh, And I think the only way that I can accept my Canadian identity is by accepting it on stage and accepting it through the stories that I, I want to tell and living with the conflict and the disparity of, of wanting to be that but being this. Uh, so <laughs> that's me in a nutshell. I, 
I just think we should just play another song for a goodwill. Uh, this is how I cook with half the ingredients. Alex? <laughs> Anita Majumdar, ladies and gentlemen. Adding to the stories, adding to the things coming on in my mind. Are you guys intrigued by everyone we've seen? You guys want to hear more? So, it was about a year ago, and I'm watching um, television as I do, and, uh, and I, see, I see this image, and I shared this with, uh, with my friend here that I just met this evening. I see this Fox reporter. Now, do you guys know who I'm talking about here? So, this Fox reporter, this news anchor we'd like to, you know, she got a really high-playing high job, grill this intelligent man about why he wrote something and how he was qualified to write this and why would he do this. And it was, do did, did you guys know what I'm talking about? Did you guys see this? Yeah. So... And I, I was like, I walked away, I go, that guy is the coolest guy on earth, and if I get a chance to hang out with this guy, and I had a beer with him earlier this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, born in Iran, he lives in Los Angeles, Reza Aslan, best-selling Iranian-American writer. He's, his book, uh, best, uh, bestseller on the New York Times, number one, uh, Zealot, the Life and Times of Jesus of Nazareth. Um, He's not only a scholar, but he's also a gentleman. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome up Reza Aslan. Please, come on up. You can jump right up here. Wow, sorry about that entrance. I was uh, up in the balcony where all the fun is happening. Yes, all right. You know, this used to be a porn uh, theater and the balcony is still sticky. Um, <laughs> hi. Uh, I'm the foreigner for the evening. Uh, you know, when you uh, make a living writing about religion and, and politics, you're doing so, uh, you know, based on the two topics that you're not supposed to discuss in proper company. Um, Good thing you, you guys do not look like proper company. So that's, uh, and you, no wonder, right? Because, I mean, when you look at these two things, they're pretty loathed topics, politics and religion. Uh, with politics, I mean, it's true definitely on both sides uh, in the U.S. and in Canada. I mean, Stephen Harper, Jesus Christ, Stephen Harper. Or as we in America call him, the polite George Bush. Um, <laughs> Politics, not very popular. In the United States, uh, it, it's not... What's amazing is not that 93% of Americans have an unfavorable view of the U.S. Congress. It's that 7% of Americans have a favorable view of it. And we have a, um, a term for that 7%. We call them fucking morons, actually. Um, and then religion, obviously. Religion... Uh, you know, is, is not the most popular topic uh, when you look at what's going on around the world, even today in Israel-Palestine. And, and uh, you know, you sort of understand where you hear these people talking about how religion is responsible for, you know, the great violence and, and disaster in the world. I always have to remind people that, you know, secularism has been, you know, pretty good at killing people too. In fact, the, the last hundred years of human history has not only been the most bestial century uh, in human existence, uh, but it has been so precisely because of secularist ideologies like nationalism and fascism and Marxism, communism, Maoism, Stalinism. These are atheist uh, ideologies that have been responsible for the deaths of tens of millions of people. So it turns out we'll just kill each other for any reason, be it religion or, or uh, you know, nationalism or ethnicity or tribe. But you totally understand when people decry the, the role of uh, religion in politics, when they talk about how the key to peace and, and prosperity and understanding is to separate 
religion and politics, and I totally understand that. It makes sense when you think about it. The problem is that we have a false understanding of what religion is. You see, religion is not about beliefs and practices. Religion is not about the things that you believe or the rituals that you go through. Religion is far more a matter of identity than it is a matter of beliefs. This is true, by the way, of all religions in all parts of the world for all time. I, you know, I'm American, so I, I have to sort of use the American example. In the United States, if you listen to the polls, uh, about 70%, 70% of Americans called themselves Christian. 70%. Seven out of ten Americans. I want you to think about that for, for one minute here. Seven out of ten? Really? Seven out of ten? Seven out of ten Americans go to church on Sunday. Seven out of ten Americans read the Bible on a regular basis. Seven out of ten Americans can tell you anything about Jesus except that he was born in a manger and died on a cross. Of course not. The vast majority of that 70%, when they say, I am a Christian, are not making a faith statement. They're making an identity statement. And that's true whether you call yourself a Hindu or a Buddhist or a Muslim or whatever. Religion is about identity, not about beliefs and practices. And as a matter of identity, it encompasses every other aspect of your identity from your politics, to your economic views, to your social views. It's about how you see yourself in the world. It's about how you understand your role in this indeterminate world that you live in. And so, this notion that seems logical in your mind, it, seems, it makes perfect sense. Remove religion from politics and everything will be fine. After all, politics is about compromise supposed to be about compromise. Religion is about absolutisms. And so if we just separate these two, then we'll have greater understanding, greater agreements among each other. Religion in many ways is just a poison in our politics. It makes sense logically, but it's based on a fallacy. The truth of the matter is that you cannot divide religion and politics. You cannot as much as you want to remove religion from politics because religion and politics are both means of identity formation. They are one and the same. Religion is politics. And this, by the way, is not just true today. It's been true for all time. The history of religion is a history of society and identification. Your religion was your tribal affiliation. Your religion was your citizenship, your nationality. Religion has always been about community formation, about figuring out who is us and who is them. But that's precisely what politics is about as well. Who is us and who is them? That's why we have different parties and different political uh, persuasions. So I totally get it when people say that we've got to separate these two, but it's impossible and it's dangerous. See, I come from, in the United States, I come from the most, I mean, religiously diverse and most religious country in the developed world. We are a country that we constantly talk about how, you know, we were founded as a Christian nation and that we have Christian values and Christian morals uh, at, the, at the heart of our constitution. And by the way, the people who usually say that the loudest are the people who are usually using Jesus to, you know, stop welfare and, and you know, get rid of immigrants, things that Jesus himself would never have talked about. And in fact, if you listen to a lot of politicians in the United States, you would think that all Jesus ever talked about was guns and gays. That's really the only two topics that Jesus ever talked about, guns and gays. But we give those people an opportunity to take part in the political process. We give them an opportunity to advance their ideas, to make sure that everyone gets an opportunity, every, all the people get an opportunity to actually vote on whether they agree with those notions. That's not the case in large parts of the world. 
When you look at, for instance, what's happening in Egypt, where people espousing a religiously political view are being violently oppressed. Everywhere in the world in which that has happened, in which religion has been forcefully excised from government, from politics, the result has been the radicalization of religion. So it's not a good idea, it's a dangerous idea, and in any case, as I say, it's impossible. Okay, so then what's the answer? The answer isn't removing religion from society because that's not going to happen. The answer is that if you want to actually confront religious violence, the only force that can do so is religious peace. The only force that can confront religious misogyny is religious feminism. The only force that can uh, confront religious bigotry is religious pluralism. We talk so often about you know, the, the, the catastrophe of religious violence, of religious conflict around the world, and we pretend that we can get rid of those conflicts if we just remove religion from the equation. But religion is not going to be removed from the equation. We've been talking about the death of God for a hundred years. At the beginning of the 20th century, one half of the world's population identified itself with one of the five major religions of the world, Judaism, Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam. 100 years of social progress, of scientific advancement, of secularism, that number is now two-thirds. God is not dead, no matter how much we wish he may be. He is very much alive. So, my advice to all of you, all of you who are worried about the state of conflicts around the world, those of you who recognize that religion often plays a pretty profound role in, in these conflicts, my advice to you is to shout louder than the fanatics, to be more present than the extremists, because the only way that we can ever combat religious conflicts in this world is if people who are dedicated in, to religious peace speak as loudly, as confidently, and as strongly as those who speak in the name of religious violence. Yes. As my people say, as, uh, as my people say, inshallah. Thank you. Nobody told me there'd be a, sta uh, a chair off stage that people just jump off of any time, but um, ladies and gentlemen, Reza Aslan, please. Yeah. <laughs> Last but not least, we have an amazing speaker coming up here, Zarka Nawaz. Do you guys know who Zarka is? Want me to tell you? Yeah. Amazing woman. Um, Born in Liverpool, grew up in Brampton, now lives in Reg Regina. That alone is a big conundrum right there for cultural identity, I'm sure. A former CBC journalist, a mother of four, she's written a book, uh, Laughing All the Way to the Mosque. She bridges cultural gaps through personal experience. I remember seeing Zarka on uh, the George Strombo show, and she's telling about her experiences growing up. and. And it was refreshing to see her views um, and showing her Muslim point of view within her, own, within her own life and on her own show. Ladies and gentlemen, putting the fun back in fundamentalism, Zarka Nawaz, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Pleasure. Oh, you can grab that mic. Yes. Hey, how is everyone today? Such an honor to be here. So it's true that I just finished writing a book called Laughing All the Way to the Mosque. But what a lot of you don't know is, uh, is Sharish out there? He also is working on a book. It's called How to Kill a Muslim 101. <laughs> he was very patient. You see, with Ramadan, I don't know if you guys know, we follow the lunar calendar, right? So that means that it goes around 
our calendar on a 35-year cycle. So it takes 35 years for the same date to come back. So fasting in winter is really easy. But he was really, really patient. He goes, I'm going to wait before I invite Zarkanawaz until it's at the longest time of the year. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I was fasting today, so I've got to make sure I don't fall down. So then he, what he decides to do is he waits till July, right, when it's 19 hours. And he's like, I'm going to wait. I'm going to do the festival in Vancouver because if she starts fasting in Saskatchewan and flies west, it adds an hour <laughs> to the fast. And I was like, but, but Cherish, like, you know, it's going to be exhausting. And he's like, and then we're going to wait until nighttime, right at the very end when Muslims are the closest to death, right? <laughs> and then we'll have you talk. And I was like, can I use a piece of paper? No. <laughs> it's going to be unscripted. <laughs> and I'm like, what's the topic? He's like, putting the fun back into fundamentalism. And I was like, but I'm not having a lot of fun <laughs> in Ramadan. Because you're going to be fine. This isn't like a TED Talk where you have to save the world. Just make people laugh. <laughs> so here I am, you guys. I survived Sharish. I lived. I survived fasting the whole day. And I've come to you guys today. And... <laughs> You know, I'm just kidding, by the way, for Sharif. I, I, I was his guinea pig, and Muslims are allowed to eat guinea pigs, even though the word pig is in them. But, you know, I'm only saying that because I have Ramadan brain, and I'm really, really hungry. <laughs> but he wanted me to talk about putting the fun back into fundamentalism. And it got me thinking, like, why is it that I like slogans so much? I have a thing about that, right? I think, you know, my slogan for Ramadan this year is... Muslims, you know, let's put down those deep-fried pakoras and those deep-fried samosas, and let's put the slim back into Muslim. Because <laughs> you can gain a lot of weight this month if you can make up all three meals instantly and then some more. So, the thing with slogans is that when you're Muslim, the, the word that describes you keeps changing. I don't know who's out there that you know, creates the words that describe Muslims. Back in my day, we were known as fundamentalists. But then it kind of changed to um, extremists. Then it, then it changed to radicals. Then it changed to terrorists. And now, now I think we're Islamists, right? Which kind of sucks. I don't really, really know what an Islamist is. But it's kind of... Like, you can't, what, what am I supposed to say now? Let's put the slam back into Islamism because it sounds like some wrestling slogan, right? So I liked it when we were fundamentalists. It was cooler. You could put the fun back into fundamentalism. And the, the idea um, for that slogan came from growing up with my parents, you know, and the only way I could describe them would be they're freaky Muslims, like really, really freaky. And they were super conservative and they would do the strangest things to me. Like, for example, I went to journalism school, and I was taught, my instructor was Stuart McLean. Have you guys heard of Stuart McLean? So I was in his broadcast radio class, and I won the award, in, you know, the, the biggest award in radio journalism. And so you go with Stuart to the Telefest Award. There's an official photographer. He's like, stand beside Stuart McLean. You're going to have your photograph taken. And I'm so happy, and Stuart's happy. We're beaming, and I feel this, you know on my shoulder, and I look around, it's my mother, and I'm like, Ma, you can't be in this picture. And she's like, neither can you. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's like, if a picture with you, with a white man, gets out, people will say, what else was she willing to do with him? <laughs> I'm like, what are you talking about? And she goes, no. My mother lived in the time of Jane Austen. Like, th this was her thinking, right? The fate, having a single daughter was a fate worse than death, and she couldn't risk that some Mr. Darcy would come and propose to me, and he'd be like, there's a picture of you hugging Stuart McLean. <laughs> and then all her hopes would have been kiboshed. I swear this happened. I had to put somebody else there so they can get their picture taken while I stood here. I raged and raged about this incident for years. It was the single most humiliating thing that had ever happened to me. And then I read a book by Nora Ephron. Have you guys heard of the late, great Nora Ephron? She was a journalist and an essayist and a memoirist. She was married to Carl Bernstein, you know, from the Watergate fame. And he had cheated on her while she was pregnant. And how she got back at him 
was she wrote a comedic novel called Heartburn. And it was about what had happened to her. And that novel turned into a feature film with Meryl Streep. And Carl Bernstein could never sue her, right? Because if he sued her, then he'd have to admit it was true. And so he was stuck now. And it was so brilliant. And Nora said the reason she had done it was because her mom had taught her that everything is copy, meaning that your life is material. So don't cry about it. Write about it. And it was brilliant advice. So that's how I decided I was going to cope with my life. I was going to spin everything that happened to me and around me into comedy. So my very first foray into filmmaking was in 1993. I was watching TV, and I don't know if you guys remember the Oklahoma bombing, when the, um, the, was the Alfred P. Murray building. It was a federal building, and it blew up. It was a horrific, you know, horrific crime. Hundreds of people died, children. And, you know, Muslim suspects were being arrested everywhere. And I was thinking to myself, oh, my God, you know, Muslims... Just like, why, you know, do, do we have to do every evil thing in this world? And then, like, literally two or three days later, a white uh, Christian fundamentalist was arrested. And I was like, whoa, wait a minute. How did we go from here all the way to here? And I got to thinking, and I thought this would make a hilarious, absurdist film. So I came up with this idea. I got um, my brother and his friend and all the neighborhood's kids together, and we, got, and we made a film called Barbecue Muslims. And it had two Muslim brothers who are sleeping one night, and the barbecue in the backyard blows up. And they're like, what happened? And the entire neighborhood says, oh my God, they must be you know, Muslim terrorists. And the brothers are like, but we haven't even been to you know, the Middle East. How can we be Middle Eastern terrorists? And they're like, no, no, it was your barbecue. It was your backyard. This is the only explanation. And they're like, but you know, we're Muslim. Islam means peace. We pray five times a day. We don't have time for violence. So they're getting carted away. Meanwhile, the rail terrorists was the anti-barbecue resistant front who were going around blowing up barbecues because they believed they were causing pollution. And they were like, you idiot, why would you go up and blow up a Muslim's barbecue, right? Because now we're never going to get any publicity because they're like protesting and no one's paying any attention to them because they're like focused on, you know, the Muslims. So that was my first film. And it got people laughing. People were laughing in the theater. And I thought, wow, you know, I can make people laugh about these subjects. I could put the fun back into fundamentalism, even if the fundamentalists aren't a lot of fun. (laughs) So then I was watching TV again, and there were these like crazy Muslim bearded guys who were screaming and flipping cars and and chanting fatwa to death to some writer because they were upset about their sensibilities being hurt. And I was like, man, someone just teach these guys the power of writing a bad review in a newspaper. You know, we could really save a lot of cars if these guys could just write about their feelings. And that's when I, the idea came to me to write a comedy film called Death Threat. And it was about a woman called Yasmin Siddiqui who writes a really, really bad schlocky novel. And no one's willing to publish it. And she's thinking to herself, I need a shortcut to fame. There's nothing like a fatwa to boost sales. <laughs> so she decides to go and upset her community and just you know, get them so angry at her that they'll sentence her to death, except that they keep accommodating her. Like, what do you want? We'll do whatever you want. Just tell us what you want. And she's like, damn it. You know, I need to find crazier Muslims than these guys. So she reads in the newspaper that there's a meeting of the Hamas, men only. So she goes there. She types out her own fatwa of death, a $3 million bounty. She says, I'll just get them to sign it. It'll be perfect. (laughs) She gets there, and it turns out it is not a meeting of the Hamas. It's a cooking class for hummus. (laughs) She had misread the sign. It was a class for men who were too embarrassed to cook in front of women. So she's like, I don't care. So she dresses up as a delivery guy, and gets the guy to sign for his chickpeas, but it's really the fatwa of death, right? And then, you know, she flashes it to all the media and they go berserk. You know, Canadian woman has just been sentenced to death, $3 million bounty. But the only thing is, the only people who are willing to kill her, who actually show up at her house with rifles, are Canadian three, two Canadian wheat farmers who's just had their wheat subsidies cut. <laughs> And like, this is fantastic, you know? Muslim fatwas with bounties attached can be like the social safety net of Canada. (laughs) 
it'll, it'll, it'll take over. <laughs> so in the end, I realized that you know, people could laugh at these things if I could just spin it with absurdity. But it wasn't just you know, television show, um, um, the news stories that were giving me fodder for my ideas. I came to the mosque in Regina, Saskatchewan one day, and there was this curtain strung across the prayer room. And women were asked to pray behind it because this imam from Saudi Arabia felt that the men couldn't concentrate if they could see women, right? And I was like, well, maybe that's their problem. Why should we be punished for that? And he wouldn't relent, and I felt I had to do something about it. So I had the slogan that says, you know, if you can't beat them, make fun of them. So it sparked an entire television series where I created an imam who was a feminist, and he believed in gender equity between men and women, and he didn't let these you know, tribal backward concepts come into the mosque community, and he would fight them. And that was the idea of the entire show, was to show his battles in this community. And it wasn't just in the Muslim community, it was, it was the mo he led a group of Muslims of mercy in a mosque, which was in a church, which was in a little town of mercy set in the, in the province of Saskatchewan. And one of the episodes that was my favorite was uh, based on what had happened in the mosque, Babur, the conservative Muslim, decides that he doesn't want men and women going through the front doors of the mosque because men and women mingle too much. And there might be some hanky-panky, like they could have sex or something before they entered the mosque. And so he said, I'd want to ban the women from going to the front door. They have to go through the back door. You know, There's only like this tiny little emergency door where they keep all the garbage. And then the women are very upset. And he's like, I'm not being discriminatory. I'm just thinking about the propriety. So the, Im the Imam, Amar, says, that's fine. If you're not discriminating between men and women, you use the back door and let the women use the front door. You know, and Barbara's like, he wasn't expecting this. So, you know, he says, that's fine. I'll just to prove that I'm not, you know, discriminating, discriminating against women, I will use the back door. So he goes back there. And, you know, the sermon's about to start and his little band of men are coming and the handle breaks off and he can't get in. And then the garbage truck comes to collect the garbage. The next thing, the men are trying to keep themselves from, they're trying to listen to the khutbah and then they're try, trying to keep themselves from getting run over by the garbage truck. And so this whole episode was about the absurdity um, that happens in the conservative element in the mosque. And so I used those situations to get people to talk about what was happening when it came to gender equity. And then we would use um, situations, for example, the, the imam decided he wanted to start a Muslim curling team in the mosque. And so Fred Tupper, Fred Tupper said, you know, cur curling, Muslims don't curl, it's like freedom or pork, it's not possible. <laughs> And so what happens is the, you know, the Muslims start curling. Fred Tupper's team, you know, who always used to win every year, they're curling. And then Ryan, who you know, is the headscarf-wearing Muslim woman, decides the Muslim team kind of sucks, and she wants to be on Fred's team because she wants to win. So she abandons the Muslim, joins Fred's team. And Fred's team is like, she is so good, this Muslim woman. Well, we're going to get rid of Fred. So he gets booted off the team. <laughs> and he's like, what's going on here? So he goes back to the rule book and realizes like 20 years ago they used to ban the nuns from curling in mercy because their head wraps would get caught, their habits would get caught in the handles. So he enacts the ban, the hijab rule, and gets Ryan removed <laughs> from his own curling team so that he can get reinstated. And then Father McGee joins the Muslim team to help them win. So ended up, we ended up doing a television, we, the episode was called Jihad on Ice. And it was how we were mixing up all the genres of curling and religion and hijab and rivalry, and we mixed it all together. And that was the magic of what Little Mosque on the Prairie was for me, was taking all the different identities and just putting it in a blender and mixing it and creating something brand new that people could laugh at. Because to me, comedy was the way in. It could get everyone to lower their guards. We could go after all the sacred cows and we could say, let's just, you know, step back a minute and look at all of ourselves. Ultimately, the show was about how everybody's faith was essentially leading us to the same thing, which was peaceful coexistence. And our differences, you know, were not big enough to divide us, but were, were those things that brought us together. And that was 
that was the magic of the show, and that was the magic of putting the fun back into fundamentalism. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow, Zarka. Thank you. There, there are stairs back here if you do want to, yeah. We're very unconventional tonight. Did you guys have fun? Yeah? Fundamentalism fun, no regular fun. An amazing group of people. Um, tonight uh, was a part of a huge festival. Um, five by 15, a huge piece of um, commentary that people are doing in places like London, Milan, New York, and it was brought to Vancouver tonight. And Sarish, Laura, the whole team at Indian Summer Festival. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Um, it's been my pleasure to just be a uh, fly on the wall, speaking, enjoying, and interacting. I'd like to bring up Sarish and uh, end off the evening. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, and good night, and Sarish. First of all, big round of applause for our ever gracious, perfectly punctual Sharad Khare. Thanks for keeping everything moving and for your kindness towards everybody. So fantastic to see you all out here tonight. I'd like to really, before we get any further, give a big hand to three amazing women who've been doing so much behind the scenes. Anushka Ratnaraja, Rupa Man, Trisha Dulku. Put your hands up, please. There they are. <laughs> and also, Trisha, you're back there. Raise your hand. <laughs> I'd also like to thank my partner, managing director, Laura Bispalco, who hates the mic as much as I love it. <laughs> I usually get propped up here with a mic and, you know, I'm happy about it. But once in a while I remember that I need to, to share that. So thanks to all of you for making it happen. Tomorrow, two amazing events. The incomparable Reza Aslan will be back in his, on his own one-man show. Tomorrow, 6 p.m., SFU Woodwards talking about the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. And this is really what Reza's book is all about. This is what got him into hot water with Fox News. And this is what we'll, we're really looking forward to hearing you, Reza. And thank you for coming all the way. Thank you for being with us. This very venue, 9 p.m. tomorrow night, an amazing array of spoken word artists, slam poets, musicians, visual artists collaborating to bring word, image, and sound together in one spot. We won't have these chairs. Uh, it'll be a dance floor. Around 11 o'clock, it'll turn into a dance party that doesn't really need to stop if you don't want it to. We'll have DJs coming in. It's going to be pretty much the final event of the festival. Uh, Shanice John Mohamed, you're in the room. Yay! Welcome. I don't know if Lee Shai Peel is here yet from Toronto, but... Sharda Ishwar, Roop Sidhu, Neelamjit Dillon. I mean, we've got some amazing, amazing names in here. So make sure you come out for that. Um, and to the Fox Cabaret. You guys, you really made it India in here. <laughs> 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 but, but really, I mean, the love and the care, uh, we've really appreciated this partnership. Um, Reza made mention of its seamy past. Uh, these guys took a flamethrower to this place, and look what they did. It's beautiful. I, the first time I stepped in here, I thought, this feels like a nightclub in Mumbai. And I think they've got it right. So thanks to you for your partnership. <laughs> Eleanor O'Keefe in 5x15 in London. You'll probably watch this video because everybody who spoke just now is going to go up on the 5x15 global site. So thanks, Eleanor, for being a part of this Geist magazine. I see Mary Schendlinger somewhere in the audience. Thanks for your support. The Writers' Fest. And Jigni Style. Where are the wonderful women from Jigni Style? Yeah. 